When John the Baptist had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As Jesus was passing by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting their nets into the sea. They were fishermen. He said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. So they abandoned their nets and followed him. As he walked along a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They too were in a boat, mending their nets. He called them. And then they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat, along with the hired men, and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Last week, I reminded you of the Feast of the Holy Family is not the Feast of the Happy Family or the Feast of the Healthy Family, but the Feast of the Holy Family, because happy is good, healthy is good, but that's not why we're here. We're called to be holy. Our fundamental call is to holiness, to share God's own divine life, to, to share his own blessed life. That's God's uh, desire for us. That's why he created us. Uh, that's why we are here. And as Pope John Paul II said, holiness is intimacy with God the Father, and imitation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, love God, love neighbor is that's intimacy with God, the Father, and imitation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that ring a bell? Yes. Okay, so let's say a little more about imitation of Christ. Last week we talked about intimacy with God the Father, this, this week um, about imitation with Christ. About a couple uh, decades ago in the 90s, there was a, big, a fad, a church fad, and it was uh, really popular to um, wear bracelets or necklaces with the letters WWJD, WWJD, really big fad, everyone um, all over the place. And of course, it stood for what would Jesus drive? What would Jesus drive, right? You know, would he drive a pickup truck? Would he drive a soccer mom van? Would he drive an Uber? You know, what would Jesus drive, right? Right, right? No. Uh, what would Jesus drink? Right, drink. <laughs> um, remember the wedding, wedding at Cana? Remember? Wedding? Jesus turned water into wine and lots of it. So I, he probably drank a little bit of wine. Um, he also drank um, from a, another chalice uh, right before his, his suffering and passion. But that's another story. So what would Jesus do? You're right. What would Jesus do? Well, we, we know from scriptures what Jesus did, that he proclaimed the kingdom of God is at hand. This is the time of fulfillment. And he, besides proclaiming the kingdom, he showed it. He healed the sick. He forgave the sinners. Um, he, he cast the money changers out of the temple. Jesus then went on to lay down his life, to suffer, die, and rise from the dead. That's what Jesus did. And, we heard today, he called Simon and Andrew, James and John, to follow him called them to follow him. Before he did all that, though, Jesus spent a lot of time with God. He prayed. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, the Spirit led him out into the desert where he fasted and prayed for 40 days. That's where we get Lent from. 40 days he fasted and prayed, spent that time with God. Then he went on to proclaim the kingdom and forgive the sick and, and, and forgive the, the sinner and heal the sick and feed the hungry and on and on and on. But first he prayed a lot. And before his passion and death and resurrection in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed on his knees, he prayed. And falling on his face, he prayed to God and then entered into his passion. So he, prayer, that's what Jesus did. We say, what did Jesus do? Well, all those actions, wonderful, great, but he also prayed. He prayed. He spent time with God. Now, you might not have 40 days to go into the desert for prayer. You might not be, the Garden of Gethsemane might not be so appealing to you as a place to pray. Um, but what we can do is what I mentioned last week. So pray where you are. Pray 
where you are at. And when I say that, again, I don't mean physically where you are, like, okay, I'm driving my car, I can pray in my car. Yes, you can drive in your car. Or um, uh, I'm standing in a shopping line, I can pray in a shopping line. Yes, you can do that. Or, or at work, yes, you can pray at work. And, of course, you can pray at church. That's what church is for. Uh, but it's, it's more than that. Not just praying where you're physically at, it's praying where you're spiritually at. Praying where you're spiritually at. And last week, I, I told you that joke about the, the man at the monastery. He can only say two words every year, so silent and so prayerful. And his first year after a year, he said what? Bed the hard, bed hard, that's what he said. Second year, what he just said? The food, cold, food cold. Third year, he said to the abbot, I, I quit. And the abbot said, no surprise to me, ever since he got here, all he'd been doing is complain, complain. <laughs> and we know that life is hard, life is cold, God is distant, there's a temptation to quit. And that's where you pray. That's where you pray. You don't have to go in the desert to pray. You don't have to go to gardening garden assembly to pray, but where you are at, good times and bad, sickness and health, that's where you pray. A couple examples of that. I um, was talking with somebody, and uh, he was having a really hard time at work. as a hostile work environment, and some of his coworkers are really trying to get him fired. And others loved him, and he loved his work and thought he was doing a good job. His bosses weren't doing anything about it, so he's really frustrated. Does he quit? Does he uh, fight back and retaliate? Uh, does he just keep his mouth shut? You know, what does he do? And so we prayed about that. I said, let's do this. Okay, just pray where you are at. You know, so just picture that, that work environment. Pray, picture what's going on there, and just be there. Uh, and, there's, and you are um, conflicted in what to do, how to respond. Uh, you love what you're doing. You don't want to quit, but what do you, what do, you do? Just, so that's where you are at. Just not trying to answer that question, but just simply notice where you are at. And so he sat there for a moment, and I said, okay, now invite the Lord to be with you where you are at. Notice the Lord with you. Lord, notice us together. So he noticed the Lord with them together. <laughs> and then we said the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, and I said, amen. And now what did you notice? I asked, did you notice anything? And he said, yeah, I noticed, first of all, peace, and then a desire not to retaliate, but to love them. But to love them. You know, it might be, you know, some tough love, but, but to love them all the same. Not necessarily to quit. Don't know what quite that's going to look like. But there's a change in his heart. There's a change in his heart. Pray where you are. Another person um, recently came in. She had uh, been fired from her job unjustly. And she had, been, um, had ruined her health. And she's very ang angry at this injustice. And uh, so we said, okay, we're going to pray where you're at. Just notice where you're at. And there's that, that anger and at the injustice. There's resentment. There's fear for her future and her family. Just all those things. Just notice what it looks like. Notice what it feels like. And just be where you are at. Notice it. And then invite the Lord to, to notice it with you. Not to tell you to do. Not to solve it. Not to resolve anything. Not analyze it. Just notice where you're at. And so that's what uh, she did. I said, amen, and did you notice anything? What did you notice? And she said, I felt a weight lifted off my shoulder. I felt a weight. She hadn't felt that good in a long time. Again, she wasn't ready to forgive people involved. She wasn't ready, didn't have any solutions for her future, wasn't providing answers, but she was no longer alone. She was with the Lord. She knew the Lord was there now. She can not only in her head, but in her heart, uh, the Lord was with her in the situation where she was, where she was at. So you don't have to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. You don't have to go out in the desert. But where you are, that's where you pray, where you are at. Notice where you are, and then invite the Lord to notice it with you. Simple. Sounds simple. But it, what you're doing actually is building intimacy. As we talked about last week, that into me see, to know and be known with the Lord. You don't have to pretend anything, like pretend to the Lord, oh, I'm happy, I'm grateful, I'm praising. No, I'm kind of miserable, Lord. I just want to notice that and help you be with me where I'm at. Or you can be joyful, too. That's a great place to pray, too. Pray with joy. Pray when things are good, too. Every day to have that habit, not just driving around, but take 10 minutes to spend with the Lord, just like you would with a good friend. Notice where you're at. And just enjoy that time with the Lord. Uh, good times and bad, just notice and pour out your heart where you're at, noticing it, and then notice it together, noticing it together. And that's what the Lord wants for you. 
that intimacy. The Lord wants to be with you in intimacy. And I told you last week, what's the church word for intimacy? Communion. Communion. That's what we receive here is intimacy, communion with, with God and his church. That intimacy that our heart craves and that we yearn to be known and to be known. And as you, as you do that and come to know the Lord better and, and be yourself with the Lord more, then you're able to trust him more and hear his voice more, how he's, how he's leading you, and to know the will of God that leads into greater life and joy and peace. Not that it won't be easy, but there's a greater trust and ability to hear how the Lord is calling you. Like Jonah. Jonah, first time, not interested when the Lord had to say to him, ran away, the great fish brought him back. And so the second time, Jonah says, okay, Lord, you win. I'm going to the Ninevites. I'm going to tell him, 40 days, you guys will be destroyed. You know, you know make, up, make your, pack your bags. You're done. <laughs> and they repented. They repented. Because Jonah heard the call of the Lord, heard it again, <laughs> and did it. And it, it saved the city. Or like Peter and Andrew, James and John, fishermen, good, awesome, wonderful livelihood, but they left it all. When Jesus called them to become fishers of men, they dropped their nets. They abandoned their nets. They left their families. They left their father, Zebedee. They left everything they knew, and they followed him. They followed him. And what happened? Because they knew the Lord, and they followed the Lord, they became fishers of men change the world.